All right, so a pleasant good afternoon, everyone. And today we'll be looking at chapter one, which is the overview of the immune system. This work comes from Kubi Immunology and is related to the immunology course, which we are looking at. So when we think about immunology, yes, we did mention that immunology deals with the body's ability to prevent disease or pathogens, disease causing pathogens from actually causing infection. This whole issue relating to immunity, um, the, which def, from a de definitive perspective, the state of protection coming from the words, the Latin for immunus, meaning exempt, right, is this state where of protection against pathogens. So that's what the body does. And specifically, when we look at it, yes, we have the immune system. Yes, we have specific structures within the body that assist the immune system. And most critically, we do have uh, that organ system, the skin, the integumentary system, which lends perhaps the greatest first barrier to infections. Now, when we think about immunity, can we generate immunity without disease? And yes, in particular for our current situation in this post-pandemic COVID era, we have become or we have seen the importance of vaccination. And what vaccination does, it prepares the immune system to eradicate an infectious agent before it causes a disease. All right, so that's one of the good things relating to it. And widespread vaccine has saved numerous lives. Even, of course, now it is under a lot of scrutiny as it's relating to COVID. And in terms of the scrutiny, we look at both the two of the giants, the CDC and the WHO. But one of the things we have to appreciate in terms of the information that is out there, it is always critical to get your information from reliable sources. A lot of persons talk about vaccine hoax. Hoax, you know, that is not true. Uh, to this whole COVID situation is but a figment of our imagination. In terms of getting your information, always important, go to reliable sources, go to the CDC, go to the WHO website, and also when you do that, ensure that you understand what is written on the topic itself. There's a lot of misinformation out there and people run with it and repeat it. On the topic of misinformation, you know, I was just, just yesterday I was listening to the BBC. They were talking about what has happened in the Philippines where um, the former dictator over there, Ferdinand Marcus, his son, Bong Bong Marcus, that was, that was his nickname, he currently has been declared the, uh, president, the presidential candidate, you know, because it has shown that he has won the election. And what, what has been said, this is according to Al Jazeera Network, it has said that his campaign was one based on misinformation. In other words, then when he was talking about his uh, her predecessor in terms of his family and his father's reign, which was one of terror, which killed a number of persons, you know, he declared that all of this isn't true. And he put out this big campaign in which he undermined facts. So that's just an example that how, you know, where things are concerned, particularly in this age of information and rapid exchange of information in which we live in, always important to go to the sources. So as that relates to vaccines in particular, always important, go to reliable sources, Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the WHO. I had the pleasure of working at the CDC over in Atlanta, and I could tell you, yeah, they do a pretty good job over there. Let's continue. All right, so here's, these are just showing some selected infectious diseases in the US before and after the introduction of effective vaccines. So this would be in data which would support the claim that vaccines are indeed useful in terms of mitigating the effects of certain diseases and promoting wellness. So out of all of these, which, which one uh, was the most um, significant in terms of reducing deaths out of all of these shown here on the table? Which one do you think was most effective? I'm throwing that question out. Which one do you think was most effective? Smallpox. 
smallpox. Okay, so we had pre-vaccine, so 48,000 cases, and then it went down to zero. All right. Was there any that was better than smallpox in terms of reducing the number pre-vaccine? From this here? Yeah, from the data on the table. Oh, diphtheria? Diphtheria from 175 Ooh, rubella, down rubella, to zero. Rubella. rubella, there you go, rubella or measles, right? Like it brought it down, down from five, from nearly half a million down to virtually nil, right? So rubella in this case, yeah, that was the most effective one, but that is concerned. Very interesting story with paralytic polio, this one seen here, even though the numbers were a little lower. Over in the US, that was a big problem in terms of polio and, um, now, polio, it does, if left untreated, it, cause, it causes paralysis, and it ultimately could lead to uh, death, particularly in children. Now, interesting story. This is probably one of the few cases in which um, having poor sanitary condition helped. So there were these two cases. Um, so in the border region uh, in Texas, right, there was this town. And of course, it's just a fence and you're over. And the other side was Mexico. So the thing was, the persons over in Mexico, they had poor sanitary conditions and sewage was rampant, you know, just sometimes flowing in the streets and so on. Children would play, you know, running through the water. As they say, God protects children, you know, <laughs> from harm. So these children would unwittingly go through it. And the thing is, they would get infected, sorry, not infected, but they were exposed to the virus that causes polio from a very early age. So they developed um, initial, uh, an initial barrier against the disease itself. And this helped them as they grew up. They found that over in Mexico, the cases of polio was indeed very low. Whereas just right across the fence, where you had the built up areas, you had housing complexes, you know, and these people had, of course, proper sanitation. The introduction or the exposure to the um, virus that caused polio, it wasn't done at an early age, such that these children, when they did reach into their teens, early teens, they did develop polio. So the thing with polio, it's uh, in terms of the route of transmission, uh, it's a fecal to oral transmission. Uh, so it goes through the digestive tract. However, once it gets through the digestive tract, the virus could then penetrate through the walls of the uh, intestine and get across to your nervous system, particularly your vertebra, the vertebral region, and by extension, your spine. And that's how it actually causes um, paralysis, you know, in terms of fecal to oral route. So you walk through it, you know, you splash up, you touch it, and you get it to your tongue, goes through your digestive tract crosses the membranes into your nervous system. So it goes from digestive to nervous system causing paralysis. And this is just one case in terms of um, where they were exposed at an early age, where it did prevent. So the cases in this town, um, close to, uh, I wanna say it's Tijuana, Mexico, the incidences was very low. So, you know, as they say, sometimes it's one of the rare instances because we have been always told, you know, stay away from sewage and so on. But this was one incident where sewage actually did help them. All right, so back to the historical perspective. So immunity has both humoral and cellular components. And it's very important to appreciate those two differences. And if you do have your notebook, it will be a good time to write down those two, two concepts because they do repay themselves as we go. Humoral immunity and cellular mediated immunity. Let's touch and see what they're all about. The humoral immunity combats pathogens via the release of antibodies, whereas the cell immunity involves primarily T lymphocytes. And the T lymphocytes, how they do it, they eradicate these pathogens or aid other cells in inducing immunity. Whereas with the humoral response, we're talking about antibody production. So very important to differentiate between the two, the humoral and the cell mediated. Now, in so doing, the clonal selection comes in. And when we're talking about B and T cells, and we look at it in a second, the B and T cells you refer to the cells that actually mature either in the bone marrow or the thymus. So once again, write down B and T cells in terms of looking for future research on them. And when these cells interact, 
with its antigen, it is selected and becomes activated. When we're thinking about antibody antigen, write, write those two down as well, those two words, antibody antigen interaction to see. So when you're thinking about antibodies, they look specifically for antigen. Now, what are we referring to? Yesterday, we mentioned all about receptors and how receptors then they bind, they look for a specific protein sequence. Antibody antigen, very similar. We're looking at protein sequence, sequences that bind to the antibody. And that is how antibodies are very specific for certain types of proteins. These proteins could be um, specific to a pathogen shell in terms of on the membrane of the pathogen itself. And this is how recognition occurs. So here it is, uh, when you're looking at a vertebral body, here it is, uh, we're looking at a mouse. So the humoral and the cellular response. B lymphocytes, so-called because the lymph these lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow, and T lymphocytes, so-called because they mature in the thymus. So with these B cells, you do have an antigen being produced, and then the antibodies are produced, which then eliminate the antigen, the antibodies. So the antibodies, they're very specific to certain, here you see like receptors on the pathogen surface or membrane. So the antibodies recognize them and then destroy it. Whereas with cell-mediated response themselves, the T cells, here we see they do recognize it, and you have the killing of the infected cell by direct contact or by cytokine secretion, which could then lead to antigen elimination as seen in the B cells. So these pathogens or these disease causing entities, what categories do they fall into? Well, there are four broad types. We mentioned viruses, we mentioned the polio virus just now. There are also fungi, parasites, and bacteria. Bacteria could cause things like TB, uh, whooping cough, cholera, and Lyme disease. All right. TB, of course. Um, how does TB manifest itself? How do you know somebody has TB? Anybody wants to share on that one? TB. There's a coffin, as well as yeah. Coughing, right? You hit a nail on the head, right? So they send them up to Cora, most definitely. And one of the big things, have you all been, anybody been to up Cora? Anybody ever went up by the river there? And when you, yeah? Rihanna, have you been up there by Cora? Yes, sir. Yeah, and you know how on the way you have ever been, well, the hospital is higher up. You don't have to necessarily have you, or do you pass by the hospital to get to the river? Uh, it's been so long since I've been up there. I think you pass by the hospital to get, to get to the river. There you go, yeah. right. And if you notice the location, back in the day, the hospital was the only thing up there. Of course, now, you know, you have the development in all around it and so on. But back in the day, it was up there alone. And one of the reasons why they chose up there, it's high in the mountain. And if you have actually go to the hospital, I don't know if they've modified it somewhat now, because there's a different view on it. But back in the day, what they would have is big windows that could open out. So when you did, or when you um, were infected, let's say with a bacteria causing TB, uh, tuberculosis, right, it affects the lungs. So what they would do, they would have you up there, you know, one is isolated and two as well, the air is moist. And that helps in terms of the breathing. When you do have moisture present in air, it enables the lung to take it up much simpler, which is why when you look at for asthmatic cases, right? You always, uh, you use a nebulizer, they bubble the, or the oxygen through a liquid and that actually hastens the absorption by the lung. So moist oxygen is easier to take up than dry oxygen. All right, so these are just images showing the different, um, the four classes that we looked at, bacteria, virus, parasites, and fungi. So this, the immune response is all about recognition. And we spoke to that last day in terms of recognition of particular protein sequences in particular proteins. Whenever we think about the 
molecules that are actually active within the body itself. The most, while you do have different classes, yes, you do have carbohydrates, which are complex sugars, you have fats and lipids, but the most functional type are always proteins, right? So always do keep that in mind when you're thinking about interaction between receptors, when you're thinking about antibody antigen interaction. So look at it from the perspective that you're having protein recognition, sequence recognition on the part of the antibody antigen complex or on the part of the receptor and binding to its target sequence. These humoral and cell mediated uh, immunity, they do rely on these B and T cell receptors. And they are randomly, the B and T cells are randomly generated by re rearrangement in the B and T cells. So ultimately, the random generations would eventually lead to a sequence that actually matches up to the one that is required for the cell. Most of the most of those that are produced, they are non-viable, which means they're not, um, they don't have the ability to be used and they are deleted during the development process. So this is showing from a stem cell. Here you have the formation. So you know you have the random generation. So you have different sequences. These will be deleted one and four per se, they are not of the type required, but two and three, yes, these are the ones that could possibly be used. In particular, two is the favored one, so it binds to the antigen, so therefore when, it, when that is observed, you will have selection for this one, such that clonal selection and expansion, so now you'll have a lot of clones, clones meaning you'll have more than one copies uh, of the original one being produced, and these are then circulated throughout the body. So one of the more important concept, concepts sorry, to understand is this whole issue of tolerance. And what tolerance does, it ensures that the immune system avoids destroying host tissue. In other words, tolerance enables the immune system to recognize self. And we mentioned that yesterday, the whole notion of recognition of self, self-recognition is critical. We'll see in about six slides, we'll see some of the issues that arise when you do not have self-recognition. And that is a very big problem, when you don't have self-recognition, when the body turns on itself. Now, when you think about anybody here familiar with any um, any diseases in which your body turns on itself, yes, yeah, so you have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, anybody familiar with them? Or any? do you know of anybody that actually has it? has this ailment? Um, yes, sir. my mother, she had rheumatoid arthritis. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about it from a practical perspective, that, you know, having a autoimmune disease in which your body attacks itself. Now, isn't that just the, <laughs> I would say of all the, the possible disease, it, it is a rather naughty one, tongue in cheek. Because imagine you're attacking yourself, you know, and it, it most indeed, yeah, it is, it is very, very tricky. My brother had MS, multiple sclerosis, and similarly, you know, is, you see them, you know, it gets progressively worse. Sometimes it does go into remission, depending on the type of drugs that is used. Um, but, you know, other than that, you know, you've seen them in pain. And the thing is, it's not like you could hide from it. It's not like it's a, uh, something externally that is causing it, but it's your actual immune system that now is attacking your own body. So autoimmune diseases, these are very special ones. And a lot of research is currently being targeted on it because of the fact of, uh, there has been a significant increase in um in these autoimmune diseases, sorry, I don't have the figures right now, but it's very, it's something that is of grave concern because of the fact that it is in essence your body just attacking itself. So in response to these uh, pathogens, you have two types of uh, responses, the innate and the adaptive immunity. And when we look at these two, we have to look at it in terms of these categories in terms of response time, specificity, response to repeat infections. So this is, should it come back? How does your body respond to it? And the major components associated with each of these protective barriers. When we look at the innate, the time response, 
it's on the order of minutes to hours, so it's very quick. And these are the ones um, which respond almost automatically, and it's very quick. The adaptive takes longer, it takes on the order of days. The innate, because of the swiftness, is limited and fixed, whereas the adaptive, it's highly diverse. It takes a longer while, so it's, it's able then, you know, to recognize a multiple set of different uh, pathogens. And the innate response, because of its limitations, it's the same one each time. But the adaptive is more rapid because of the fact you have uh, memory cells being produced in this regard. And the major components of the innate is, of course, your good barriers, your skin. We spoke about that yesterday. Skin is very effective in terms of that. Phagocytes, in terms of phagocytotic activity in which you do have a phagocytotic vesicle being formed around the pathogen, then the release of lytic enzyme from the lysosome, which causes the destruction of that pathogen. And of course, specific pathogen recognition molecules. Whereas with the adaptive, the main one to remember as well, not with start, from the TNB lymphocytes, is the antibody production. So just to elaborate, we mentioned these three things in terms of characteristics associated with the innate immune response. And then with the adaptive, these are some of the characteristics which we just mentioned. They both, however, they, it's very important to remember they work cooperatively and the activation of the innate, it produces signal molecules, which are cytokines. Anytime you hear the term cytokines going forward as it relates to immunology, it should come or it should automatically trigger within your mind. Cytokines, we're talking about signaling molecules, right? So that's their major purpose as it relates to immunology. Cytokines are signals. They are specific in terms of signaling and they stimulate and direct adaptive immune responses. Let's have a look. So this memory, so this is showing here the magnitude of the response. So notice in the first instance, the primary response, right? We're looking at the adaptive immune system. Yes, it gives a response after 28 days, the primary response is finished. But notice in the second instant, if you do have a repeat, this antigen, right? Once it recognizes it for a second time, notice the response and the magnitude of the response is much greater. With the innate, you do have virtually the same type of response in both the first and second instance. But with the adaptive, we notice that the magnitude of the response, right, is much greater. And this is where vaccination comes in. With vaccines, you know, either they would give you an attenuated virus, virus, so one that is weakened and is no longer pathogenic or disease causing, or they would actually, as you, you will see in, in later chapters, we're looking at RNA viruses, so RNA vaccines, sorry, which is the latest thing, um, mRNA vac vaccines. And this has the capabilities of really turning medicine on its head. So take note of that in your book as well. Vaccines, mRNA vaccines, attenuated vaccines. So do take note of those. So in terms of the immune, these are the, this is the last thing we'll be looking at in terms of chapter one, dysfunctions of the immune system. Uh, two broad categories, uh, allergies and asthma, which are overly active. And of course, for allergies, this is where the EpiPen pen comes in. Right? So Epi, the EpiPen, which is just a drug which quickly delivers epinephrine. And in terms of favorite target, it's targeted to the leg because of the existence of that large muscle, right? Both there. And of course, where's the other area that vaccines or even injections are often given? Below the waist, where else is given? And your bum. Yes, and your bum, because there's a large muscle there as well, the gluteus maximus. So therefore, large muscle implies large blood supply so therefore they could inject it there and into the muscle and it will be rapidly disseminated or spread throughout the body itself right so for persons with allergies some some persons they need to have the epipen with them because what does epinephrine do what epinephrine does it prevents anaphylaxis from happening or the constriction of your trachea which could lead and your bronchial passages which could actually cause death. So the release of epinephrine or adrenaline, same name, epinephrine, 
is what is called in the US and they call it adrenaline in the, in the UK. But it's the same thing, epinephrine and adrenaline. But these, these pens are very important in terms of a bron they're dilated, they cause bronchodilation or vasodilation as well. Autoimmune disease, we mentioned MS as well and Crohn's disease. Uh, yeah, this has to do with your digestive system. And, and I'm going to have the one with the um, intestine. Okay. Yeah, correct. It's a digestive. And, you know, quite recently, we've seen this upsurge in diseases or ailments relating to the digestive tract. If you were to hazard a guess, what do you think is causing that up, upsurge in diseases or ailments relating to the digestive tract? One word. I mean, yeah, what would you say is causing it? If you had to hazard a guess, nothing too complicated. Keep it keep it simple. What goes through the digestive tract? I'm not going to say food. What people, yeah, what people yeah. Food. Always speak your mind. Always speak your mind. As I often tell my students, if ever you give a response and I laugh at you, I will have to give you a voucher for two hundred dollars to have lunch on me, right? Because <laughs> I should never do that as a teacher. I always remember when I was in school, one of my teachers did me that. I was doing physics and um, I was going to, he asked a question, I was going to respond. And you know, he, he made a clung of me and I never said anything again in physics. And in fact, <laughs> I suppose you have to thank him because, because of that little encounter with him. I moved away from physics, you know, I was too glad again to do it at O level and get rid of it. And then I moved to biology. I did biology at A level. And well, I took the path that <laughs> ultimately led me to here. So maybe everything for a reason and a season. But yeah, but it's never right to laugh at somebody because one of the things which I have, I could tell you that, and when you look historically, when you look at the Nobel Prize winners, or if you look at persons who distinguish themselves, sometimes we have to get think, thoughts from outside of the box, you know, sometimes, and that actually leads to certain discoveries because somebody is not um, schooled within the framework of certain things. They could just come and make a discovery just like that, which has tremendous potential. There are numerous examples of it, you know, uh, so always remember that fact, yeah? Okay, so food, yeah, so I would encourage you, uh, if, you're, if you haven't done so already, to grow your own food, because I assure you, you'll be pleasantly surprised, particularly what kind of chemicals that they use in the food, and which is what is responsible for these plethora of diseases and ailments which we currently have, is those chemicals that they use on the food. And of course, GMO, genetically modified food as well. That's another one which contributes to all of these ailments. So, you know, I would strongly recommend if you haven't done so, I'll, you could start with a little um, styrotex cup, you know, put some dirt, right? One of the easier things to grow, you know, some with a quick turnaround, peppers, pimento, cucumber, or something of that effect. All right, but grow something for yourself and um, yeah, you'll be doing your body great good. I digress, let's go forward. So in terms of the categories, we have misdirected immune, immunodeficiency, in which you have loss of the immune function. And this is, is a sure one instance here, thrush, uh, which is this in terms of its manifestation on the town. Ah, transplanted tissues and cancer, always have to be careful with transplanted tissue. Right, because the body would reject the transplanted tissue as it does not recognize it as self, it recognizes it as non-self. So what do you think, what do you think has to be done? When you look at somebody who has some transplanted tissue, what do they have to take? Or what do you think has to be done in order for that tissue to stay there? Remember, the immune system is actually recognizing it as non-self and is attacking it. So what do you think, and what kind of medication do you think that has to, they have to take for the rest of their lives? Immunosuppressants. What you're saying, yeah. So they take immunosuppressants, in other words, drugs that suppress the immune system because the natural tendency of the immune system would be to destroy it, destroy those tissues and organs. So they take immunosuppressive drugs, which is why persons who do have transplants, you know, sometimes they look a little sickly or they're more 
susceptible to getting infections, which could then go forward, you know, manifest itself in terms of a full-blown disease. So they always have to be careful in terms of if they do have the, of how they manage, let's say, simple things, quote unquote, like the common cold or stuff like that, it could develop into things which are uh, more severe. So that is always something, immunosuppressive drugs, they have to take them when they do take transplants. Cancer, of course. What is cancer? Nothing more than good cells gone bad. You can look at it, you know, in a multiplicity of different ways, but just good cells gone bad, right? They, know, they do not normally, they do not do their functions, and that's bad. English construction, I use the word do twice in a very short space of time, right? But they don't carry out their functions effectively, and in so doing, they cause issues in the body itself. With cancer as well, you could have these tissues moving or metastasizing to different parts of the body, and that's where they cause problems because it could ultimately lead to organ failure. We'll speak more to that at another lecture. So in summary, immunity, complex subject, has many layers, and to appreciate it fully is very important to start at a basal level and appreciate the terms associated with them. Understanding how immunity works, it does allow us to exploit the prevention through vaccinations and exploit it to treat illnesses such as shutting down autoimmune diseases or ramping up anti-cancer responses, right? And also provide safer organ and tissue transplants. All right, so that is chapter one and we will stop there for today. I have a question about the transplant. Yes, go ahead. There was a man who recently had a heart transplant from a pig, right? Mm -hmm. And he died again two months. So when they genetically alter the pig for a member the same for viruses that humans don't carry and why he wouldn't have a better chance if they already genetically modify any pig and then growing the heart, growing the organism. Until I'm not familiar with the case. I remember seeing it, but I didn't read it. So I'll tell you what, I'll go do some reading on it and get back to answer it for you. But I remember this the case, but I just didn't read it. You know, that situation where they did um, do the genetic modification. What I do now, I, I, I did, in terms of my reading, yes, pigs are often used because of the fact that um, their organs, you know, they're closely related to humans in terms of that. So yes, they could do it. They would have to do some modification, yes. Um, probably in terms of immune response, yes, um, to do some genetic modification such that the, the receptors present on the tissue, when it, it closely, it more closely resembles that which is present in the patient in which it's going. But I'll have to do a little more reading on that. That's outside of my field, cardiology, but I'll have to do some more reading on that to give you a comprehensive answer. But that's a very good question you asked there. But I just don't know sufficiently to, to respond to it. But that's a very good question you ask. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. So let me stop there for that one and let me get. If I could just, um, with Zoom, Zoom, I guess I'll, I'll restart it. I'll have to take both of them together. I so said, if I could, if there's a way in Zoom, anybody familiar, we could stop it and start another one. Anyhow, I just put it on board for now and I will. We're now moving on to chapter two, um, Kubi immunology, in terms of examination of the cells, organs, and microenvironments of the immune system. So when we're talking about the cells associated with the immune system, the responses which we get collectively from them is very well coordinated. And I often like to use the example or use the term that the body in itself is a very well-oiled machine. And that's no joke in terms of doing all of these things and not only doing them, but doing them at the level of the micro on the order of micrometers in size. And I'm not sure if we fully appreciate how small a micrometer is. So let me see if I could illustrate what a micrometer is. If you would, touch your thumb and your forefinger together. Yeah? Everybody doing that one? Yes, sir. Right. Now, pull them apart until you could now see 
a space between them, right? Take it apart. You see, you're now seeing light between the two. So pull it apart until you could now see light passing between the thumb and forefinger. You, you could see that, yes? Yeah. That is one millimeter. Now imagine you're dividing that up into a thousand, and that is actually each one of those one thousandth of a millimeter. That's a micrometer, right? So when we're talking, um, when we're talking about cells, imagine that these all of these functions. We're thinking about glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs, you know, at the level of the cell. And these things are happening, you know, in things which are micrometers in size. is is mind blowing, you know, when you think about it. And I, I am just never, you know, I, I I never really stop thinking, you know, in terms of the size of of to appreciate the complexity. When you thinking about glycolysis, all of these enzymes are responsible, let's say, for breaking down sugars, and they exist. And when you think about a cell, you know, cell in the order anywhere between, let's say, five to hundred micrometers in size. And all of these things are occurring in them when you're looking at the immune cell, T and B cells, you know, these cells on the order of micrometers and all of these things happening. Isn't that just absolutely mind blowing? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I always find it, you know, because we speak about it, you know, we speak about all the, you know, immunity, T and B cells and all of these things. And we speak about glycolysis, you know, like abstractly. But when you stop and think about it, wait now, these things are happening, you know, at that level, mind blowing. And it is done consistently. You know, it is just absolutely incredible when you think about it. And all of that points to the human body, that body machine, that body incredible. Let's continue. So when you're thinking about the cells, all of the cells come from one source, the hematopoietic stem cells. And stem cells, so-called, because that's when you think about a plant, where you have a stem going up the middle, and then you have all of these, you have branches coming off, and you have leaves. So in other words, the stem is the origin, but you can have branches going out, and then you could have a creation of different things. So with stem cells, these are the original, you can think about quote unquote original cells. When you're thinking about division at the level of after unification of sperm and ova at conception, formation of the zygote, you know, then you have the blastocysts and then you pull the subdivisions, the cells that are formed are stem cells. And from those stem cells, you have the entire body being formed. So stem cells are by the very nature, they're very plastic. Plastic in terms of they could be formed into any other type of cells. So when we're looking at the hematopoietic stem cells, they have the, these are ones that are found in the bone marrow specifically, and they have the ability to differentiate into many type of blood cells. So the red and white, they are, these develop from a pluripotent, from the pluripotent uh, hematopoietic stem cells during hematopoiesis or blood formation. And it is a very highly regulated process. Let's see if we can have a look at this. When we're looking at the hematopoietic stem cell, you have two lineages. You have the myeloid and the lymphoid. And from these two lineages, you have specific type of cells being formed. From the myeloid progenitors, right? You have monocytes, granulocytes being formed. The granulocytes are those so-called so the basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils. Granulocytes called so-called because of the fact that they have grains. You have the granulocytes, you have the megakaryocytes, and then you have the erythrocytes or the red blood cells being formed from the myeloid progenitor cells. Right? So this is again the hematopoietic stem cells, and you have the myeloid progenitors, then you have the lymphoid progenitors, and these form the NK cells, T and B cells, and you also have formation of the dendritic cells, which we spoke of yesterday, dendritic cells very important and they're usually found in the mucus bound areas of the body. So in terms of the cells and their concentration and distribution, let's have a quick look. So within the bone marrow, you have these hematopoietic stem cells, which are constantly renewed and directed to differentiate into the two 
progenitors that we just mentioned. So the white blood cells in terms of their differentiation into these types. What is the most abundant of the white blood cells? Based on this information here, what is the, what is the most abundant? Neutrophils? Yes, 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 actually. It would, take, it would have taken you a little bit to actually go through it. And I could hear the mental um, gears changing, but fortunately for you, they would put in order. But I saw what threw you off was the tree and the tree here, yes? So you know, you think, and wait, I wonder how close they are. But the neutrophils, most definitely, they form almost more than half of the new total leukocytes or white blood cells in your body. Right, so those are the most abundant of the lot. And these are just images showing them, the megakaryocytes. Um, the megakaryocytes are shown here, very important for platelet formation, right? So anytime I think of the word mega, big, they break off certain portions and they form the platelets. Platelet is very important for the clotting cascade. So, when we're looking at the myeloid progenitors, so the major ones, as pointed out before, the red blood cells, the monocytes, the granulocytes, or the grainy ones. Anytime you think of grain, I think of Ben. Um, Spider-Man's, excuse me, Spider-Man's uncle, he, was Uncle Ben? Yes. I don't know how I draw that parallel, but anytime I think about granulocytes, I think about Spider-Man. And when I think about Spider-Man, I think about Uncle Ben. And when I think about Ben, I think about basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils. I know that's a kind of uh, circuitous route, actually, get it? But that's how I remember when I think of granulocytes. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, mm -hmm, et cetera. Granulocytes, megakaryocytes, as we mentioned, very important for the platelet formation. So now let's have a look at that relatively abundant one, that neutrophil, let's have a look at it. So this is the neutrophil shown here, right? It's multi-lobed, the basophil, right? Showing these glycogen or starches which are present there, right? And they also contain the granules which have different chemical components which we look at on the next side. And this of course is your mast cell. So within the granules of the basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophils, you have these different molecules being present. And I'd just like to point out specific ones which are very important, the proteases. What do proteases do? Well, protease, right? They help in tissue uh, remodeling, very important there. Histamine, when you hear histamines, what, what usually comes to mind? Sinus. Drugs, yeah, right? Sinus. Oh yes, in particular for yourself, right? As a asthma sufferer, antihistamines. So therefore, if you would think about it from this perspective, you, when something is wrong, you go to the drugstore and you get antihistamines. So what do you think antihistamines do in terms of their functionality? What do they do? Reduce help reduce the concentration of histamine. So this one I will go. Correct. Up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I just wanted to get to the swelling part, yeah. So antihistamines particularly, and it helps in terms of breathing, right? Um, because you do have the um, swelling of the bronchioles. So to uh, prevent that swelling, you use antihistamines in that regard. Eosinophils, notice the cytokines, signaling molecules present, and the basophils, they have both the histamines Histamines, again, relating to swelling, vasodilation, smooth muscle um, activation, and then cytokines, which are signaling, right? So they do have both of those things present. So that's why you take your antihistamines to get your swelling down. Now, why would you need to do swellings? Well, we look more at that when we're looking at uh, infection in terms of in localized uh, inflammation, we mentioned it yesterday, you know, during the lecture itself, 
but whenever you have an infection or you do have a localized uh, intrusion across, let's say, the skin penetration by, let's say, a twig or a stinger, right? Now you have to fight that infection. And that's where the histamine comes in, right? In terms of a vasodilator, histamine is released because in so doing, it brings more blood to the area. So that's why when you do have infections, yeah, right, you would have, you know, the swelling occurring. The four main types of cells, we mentioned these, the red blood cells, the monocytes, granulocytes, and megakaryocytes. Mega With the monocytes, they, in terms of their functionality, they do migrate into tissues and they differentiate into macrophages. Yesterday, we did look at it when we, we um, uh, from chapter five, when it, it had the diagram that showed the intrusion by the um, inanimate object. And what you had, you had these uh, monocytes being brought along within the capillaries. And you had, when you do have that penetration, uh, certain signaling molecules cause the capillaries to become leaky. And in so doing, it allows the monocytes to actually now get into the interstitium and get to the site of that infection to then differentiate into macrophages. And these macrophages could then do phagocytotic activity. It could also differentiate into dendritic cells, as is also mentioned here. So this is showing the monocyte, shown here, monocyte. And now the macrophage, in terms of its differential. Macrophages, they do have these pseudopodia, or the false feet. And these could now, in, when you're looking at a pathogen, um, or a bat, bat, pathogen inclusive of bacteria and other um, entities, you could have the formation of a vesicle. And then, of course, fusion with the lysosome could then cause the um, killing of the pathogen in that regard. So, macrophages, neutrophils, right? These are the specialized, they are very specialized for phagocytotic activity or phagocytosis. And the immature dendritic cells in terms of their function, do they do capture antigens, then they mature and migrate out of that location to another one. So their dendritic cells, their antigen presenting cells, and they do present it to the T cells. So do take note of those, writing it down, the different types of cells. Those are very important to uh, visualize. So the B and T lymphocytes in particular, the so-called because of the areas in which they mature, bone marrow and thymus. The lymphocytes, they appear similar, but they have different sets of proteins, which are called clusters of differentiation molecules on their surface. So that's how they're able to be differentiated because of these CDs. You'll see this um, being used a lot in the presentation. So do take note, it means cluster of differentiation. So they're just like unique like a house number that identifies each one. So here we're looking at them in terms of their structure. You have for the lymphocytes, you have the helper cytotoxic and B cell and the plasma cell is shown here and the natural killer cells in terms of their particular structure. So let's talk about OCD markers. So which particular um, markers are used and how they are able to be identified, let's have a look, see. So these clusters of differentiation, you have CD2, CD3, which are adhesion molecules and signal transduction element of T cell receptors. So when you think, when you, even though you do have a whole lot, these particular, these first three, the CD2, CD3, CD4 receptors, oftentimes when you hear presentations, oftentimes when you're, uh, things relating to the immune system, these are ones uh, which are often referred to. CD2, 3, and 4, and you would find CD8 also as well. But the reason why, because of their particular functionality, adhesion molecules, and also related to signal transduction. Signal transduction, as we mentioned, ad nauseum yesterday, refers to the binding of the receptor, recept binding of the receptor, then the signal which um, the 
transfer the signal from the level of the receptor down to the nucleus via a cascade of a type of reactions. You have different pathways which allow or facilitate that to happen with MAP kinases, mitogen, activ mitogen activating proteins, right? That um, kinase is the signaling molecule, right? And that kinase facilitation is brought about by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, right? So you have this sequence of proteins and the sequence of proteins, just like a domino effect. The first one is phosphorylated, right? And it phosphorylates the second one. The first one is now dephosphorylated. Second one phosphorylated. Now the second one is phosphorylated. It phosphorylates the third one, then it becomes dephosphorylated. So this phosphate is passed along. And in this way, you, from the level of the receptor, you could have a signal that is passed all the way down to the level of the nucleus. At the nucleus, enters through the nuclear pore, gets in and could facilitate transcription and then translation in the cytoplasm in which ultimately a protein is formed. So in looking at these CD, um, clusters of differentiation molecules, do remember the major ones are the two, three, four, and eight. And in terms of their functionality, adhesion molecules and also signal transduction. CD2, 4, and 8, uh, in particular, when you're looking at HIV, CD4 and CD8, those are the two particular ones in particular that which are unique to uh, HIV. And we would look at that in the last week of class when we are looking at diseases. Okay. So we mentioned the cells associated with the immune system, and we also mentioned some of the classes of receptors. So where do, the, where do these immune cells you know, actually develop? We did mention the B lymphocytes in terms of the bone marrow, particularly the long bones and the large bones of the body, namely the sternum, humerus, ilium, and femur. Right? What's it another name for the sternum? You know, name for it, the common name for it. Breastplate? Your breastbone or, or your breastplate, yeah, your breastbone, right? Well, this, this is not your funny bone, even though it is called the humerus, but it's a long bone, right? So again, the femur as well. This is actually the largest bone in the body, your femur. It takes tremendous stresses, this bone, because it takes the full, virtually the full weight of the body, your both femurs. And this is the, not only is it the strongest bone, but it's also the largest bone in the body, the femur. So, you know, if it is, um, yeah. let's say you're, you're having quarrel with somebody and you happen to be in a lab, so which bone would you look to grab off of the skeleton? You look to grab the femur. Yeah, because it's the largest and it's the hardest. It takes a lot of weight. All right, so the ilium, of course, the ilium, in, located in the pelvic region. This is also another large bone in which you do have the development of the B lymphocytes. The T cells, they develop initially in the bone marrow, but they migrate to the thymus to achieve uh, full maturity. So the thymus, when we are looking at the thymus, who would have a larger thymus? A uh, 25 year old female or a nine month old baby? Which one who would have the larger thymus? If you have to make a guess, yes, yes, yeah, the baby does, <laughs> actually. So when you're looking at the immune system in, and immunity within in utero, or when the baby is in the uterus itself, the thymus is primarily responsible for it. After birth, once the baby is born, uh, the thymus begins to disintegrate and get smaller until it virtually disappears by age 14 or in your teenage years, between 14 and 16, it virtually disappears. Because of the fact you have your, um, your immune system developing off of the hematopoietic stem cells in your bone marrow. But so this, the thymus serves for immunity. It serves a greater function in a baby than it does in an adult. So that is something a little uh, thing to keep in mind in terms of the thymus itself. It does get smaller as you get older. One of the few things that does does so rather rapidly. All right. All right. So the lymphoid organs now. Let's have a look at these lymphoid organs as shown here. It's very uh, important to note all of these lymph nodes. And when you go by the physician, you know, sometimes when you go the flu, I mean, let's say you had a flu or something, what do they do? 
they palpate, you say, under your neck, behind your ears. What they're actually palpating is your lymph nodes. You know, the doctor, when he touches, he or she touches, you know, those areas under your, behind your ears, under your jaw. You know, they're palpating the lymph nodes. And what does that show? When you have an active infection, the lymph nodes are, they feel a little bit solid. But when you don't have an infection going on, they actually, it's very hard to pick them up. So that's why they're actually palpating for, to see if you do have an infection going on, you know, in the lymph nodes themselves. So that's why they do palpate. I don't know, you know, when you do see them feeling around your face and so on. In terms of the drainage of the lymphatic, in this region here, the upper torso region and down the right hand, all of these are drained by the right lymphatic duct. And for the rest of the body is drained by the left lymphatic duct. Take note of that, that is usually a favorite multiple choice question. You know, in terms of the might, they might actually have a diagram showing this and label it A and this B and ask you which one, you know, what, where does it drain and so on. All right, so do take note of those in drainage patterns, right? So the right lymphatic duct, it drains the right upper torso, right portion of the face and the right arm, whereas everything else is drained by the left lymphatic duct. So do take note of this. So in terms of the lymphoid organ, let's talk about what they do. So the nose and the, the nodes and the spleen, these are the most highly organized secondary lymphoid organs your nodes and your spleen. Uh, as we speak to the spleen, if it is your, um, you continue and let's say you're doing it in the medical field. And if it is, let's say you're presenting or you're, you're present in theater or in the ER and somebody presents, let's say with some penetrating gunshot wound. And when they do open the abdomen, they see a lot of blood. Usually when they see a lot of blood, it, that points to the fact that the spleen is usually damage to the spleen. Of course, that's confirmed with x-rays and so on, right? But initially, if you do the abdomen and you see blood, yeah, the spleen is usually, um, as the first thing that comes to mind, damage to the spleen itself. So the lymph nodes, T and B cell, they're separated into distinct microenvironments, and these cells migrate toward each other during activation events for their required interaction. So now, where is this response initiated? Well, differentiation takes place in follicles of the secondary lymphoid organs. So the T cells, we, we mentioned before, that the CD4 and the CD8, these are the major ones. The CD4 T cells differentiate into helper T cells, and the CD8 T cells differentiate into the killer or the cytotoxic cells that they attack and destroy. That's why they're called killer, killer T cells that destroy virally infected cells. Now, interestingly, apoptosis could be initiated as well. When we talk about apoptosis or apoptosis, what, are we, what do we mean? What does that refer to? Uh, cell death. Cell death. Cell death. I'll put a little gravy on that rice, that rice looking white. You're going down the right path, but what more than just cell death? Self-mediated self -mediated cell death. Yeah, correct. Self-mediated. So it, it has a specific a very specific function. So when you're looking at it, it one of the pathways that is initiated is the RAS pathway, RAS. Take note of that pathway, you know, to have a look at it. And when you hear, you hear me talk about pathways, and this just means a specific set of proteins and enzymes which are linked, um, which are linked together and causes a particular um, function to occur. So for instance, when the RAS pathway is activated, it could lead to apoptosis in the cell. And very, what does apoptosis mean? A signal is sent out to the lysosomes telling them to open. And they, they just release the lytic enzymes. These lytic enzymes, they are not specific, as I like to say, indiscriminate with punishment. Right? They're indiscriminate and they will destroy everything in the cell, including the cell itself. Right? But the other thing is when a cell is infected and you do introduce or you do activate the lytic pathway um, via the RAS um, via the RAS pathway, you know, you that causes destruction of the pathogens or the viruses which are present there. Uh, and that is 
you know there are lots of other cells so killing of that cell you know is not too much of an issue because it's for the greater good and the greater good is that you destroy all of those pathogens and viruses which are present there so so these secondary uh, lymphoid organs differentiate and the B cells, they further mature in germinal centers in certain uh, tissues, and both of them will develop into long-lived memory cells in these areas as well. We mentioned the importance of these memory cells when we are looking at that diagram in, in the first, from the first chapter in terms of that when you have a secondary infection. Now it is the magnitude of the response is a lot, is much more, is greater than the initial response because of the fact you do have these memory cells present. All right, so here it is, it's just showing uh, the different regions, right? Both the right, the right and the left, left areas, which are, as we mentioned, drained by the specific uh, lymphatic ducts. And it's also showing the different organs, the spleen, spires, patches, which are located in the um, digestive tract, the small intestine shown here within the bone marrow itself, right? Area for maturation of the B cells. And then of course you have the thymus maturation of the T cells. So is that showing um, both the location of the lymphatics and also the location of the specific regions which are, which supplement or help out the immune cells. Another interesting thing to take note with, um, with this setup in terms of the lymphatic system when you were probably looking earlier in one of your EMP classes, when you were visiting digestion, the lymphatic system is also used to transport what type of food, what class of food, a particular class of food, the lymphatics, via the lacteals. I know. I'll give you a hint. Yeah. Three letter, three letters, rhymes with bat. Is it class? Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Always, always, as I say, always feel free. Even though, you know, in your mind, you might be saying, oh, I ain't sure, and I want to sound stupid. Don't ever feel that way. Just say whatever on your mind. As I mentioned, if ever you hear me laugh, well, that's nonsense. Thereafter, I will have to send a $200 voucher for lunch for you. Okay? Very correct. Fats. So the fats actually travel through the lymphatic system. Do you know why? Why do they choose to pass there? So let's say after you take a heavy meal, you eat your KFC, your McDonald's, your Wendy's burger, right, with mayonnaise and so on. Now you have it, you know, absorption at the level of the stomach. And then, you know, the passage uh, after the absorption, it passes through the liver and then it gets into the heart by what the inferior vena cava. Now it goes into your systemic circulation, right? But one of the favorite, in terms of one of the favorite, favored, passages of the fats, they prefer to go through the lack, you know, the lymphatic system as opposed to the capillaries. Why do you think so? It's for a very simple reason. One word, it begins with S, four letters, and it ends with E, and it has a Z in it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. The size. Right? So when you're thinking about fats and lymphatics, sorry, the fats, they are relatively large and cumbersome. In terms of the backbone, they have a long backbone, carbon backbone. So one of the, when you're looking at capillaries, yeah, they could pass through the capillaries, but they run the risk of actually clogging the capillary. So once again, your body, phenomenal, it has recognized, hello, my lymphatic system is actually larger, the diameter of a lymph of the lymphatic is bigger than the diameter of the capillary. So what do they do? Yeah, well, they send it through. And that's how you have the lacteals and you have the passage of these fats. It actually goes through. It prefers to go through the lymphatic system in terms of moving around the body. And it only it, what it has to do is the size because the lymphatics, they are wider than the capillaries in the body itself. All right, so this is just showing a lymphatic vessel Right, so you have the lymphatic endothelial cell we mentioned yesterday. Not only, well, you do have the lymphatic and then the lymphatic, of course, it does, let's, let's have a look back. I don't know if it's, it's shown very clearly, right? So you do, it does enter 
into the general circulation in terms of the emptying, right? It enters into your general circulation and after leaving the lymphatic and getting into your general circulation, the cells associated endothelial cells, well, not in this case, because this one is showing here, is a lymphatic vesicle, vessel, sorry. But when you're looking at your um, capillaries, right, at the level of the cells, now the capillaries can become porous and thus allowing then these cells to actually migrate into the interstitium or the areas around the cells. So now when they migrate into there, they can now get into the cell or stay on the outside and look for recognition patterns which are held aloft by certain receptor types. So that is very important to remember those things. These are just images showing dendritic cells, follicular dendritic cells, dendrites. When you hear the word dendritic cell, what other organ system also has, uh, well, uh, not dendritic cells, but cells with dendrites in them. Which other organ system? So it's an organ system where these cells, they look a lot like this. And they have these long, they have long processes coming from them that transmit. Is yes? Go ahead. Is it the nerve? Correct, is right. Yeah. Axons, right? So when you think about dendrites, Right, the dendrites, you know, they, they look just like that. And the only difference is you have um, elongation of the side of, well, the membrane, and then you have the axon, axon running down. So that the impulses which are collected at the level of the dendrites, right, they then um, will actually, right, you have signals which come from other cells, and that brings the cell to threshold. When threshold is reached, what happened in the area of the axon hillock, when you're looking at the dendrites, it causes sodium channels to open. Sodium rushes in from the external environment and causes depolarization of the internal environment. That depolarization, because the inside of the um, nerve cell, the dendrite is actually negative, inside negative. So depolarization causes it now to attract the positive sodium ions. And when it does attract, what happens when well, the negative becomes positive and now you have the moving down because the negative uh, internal environment attracts the positive charge and that's how the charge actually moves down right because of that interplay between negative and positivity which I found but yes most very correct as um, just shared there all right you, you, that was quite good there um, Rihanna you just mentioned that these dendritic cells, they look very much like the cells yeah, of the nervous system. And, and the reason why, because physically, yeah, they are alike in terms of these projections, uh, which are very dendritic in origin. Very good. All right, so the spleen, we're almost there. The spleen is first line of defense against bloodborne pathogens. And I did mention that, you know, if it is, let's say in theater, um, and you do present, somebody does present and they're with a, some type of penetrating wound and you do open the abdominal cavity and you see a lot of blood. The reason why is because of the fact that you do have the spleen actually does keep a, is a repository for blood in the body itself. You know, some blood is actually, a little bit of blood is actually stored there. So the red blood cells, they are compartmentalized in the red, there's both the red and white pulp present in the spleen. And a specialized region of macrophages and B cells, known as the marginal zone, borders this white bulk. Let's see if you could look at those things. So when you're here looking at the spleen, this is the spleen in section, stained pink. And the reason why it's stained pink, they look up, they take a particular stain, uh, known as an H and E stain, hematoxylin and eosin, that gives it this pink color. Because usually if you if you take the spleen, right, and you fix it, and then you slice it, it doesn't look this color at all. It's actually transparent. So that's why they have to stain it to visualize it. And here we are seeing the white pulp and the red pulp. Why do you think they call it white pulp here? And over here, they call it red pulp for a very simple reason. So why do they call this one white pulp and this one red pulp? Because quite rightly, right, this one is white and over here it's red. So 
white pulp, red pulp, it just has to do with the color. When they look at it under the microscope, it's, uh, this area stains, but it does remain white, whereas this one stains a darker red. We look at the spleen, let's look at another one, the malt, which is associated with the epithelial layer, the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, and hand in hand with the malt, you also have the gold. If we look back here, um, we do have the pious patches as well, which are shown here in the small intestine. But the malt, these are important layer of defense, organizes response to antigens, and they include a network of follicles and lymphoid microenvironment associated with the intestine. So you, within the pious patches, you would find that as shown here. So this is the small intestine, and this, of course, is the large intestine. You can tell the difference, smooth, and this one is, of course, more um, indented, indented. Which one of these is used to make pudding? A small intestine or a large intestine? All due respects to persons who might be Jehovah witnesses who don't believe in that, but just for biological purposes, which one is used uh, to make pudding? The small intestine or the large intestine from deep pig? Mm -hmm. Hello? All right, maybe I lost uh, connection. But the small intestine, and it could be it could be uh, seen because of the, the smoothness, um, the smoothness and the lack of indentation. Large intestine, it does have those large indentations associated with it. So this is us showing um, in the smooth intestine, small intestine, the malt, mucosal associated lymphatic tissue. And as you can see, this is their stain, how they are stained as shown here. Then you have the secondary lymphoid organs continuing. The M cells in the lining of the gut, they are unique and they function to deliver antigen from the intestinal space to lymphoid cells in the gut wall. All right, so that is their major function in terms of those M cells. And so in terms of the immune response initiation, various loosely organized and diffused lymphoid tissue also found under the skin mucosa and tertiary tissues at sites of infection, All right? So these are just showing them here within the epidermis where you could have migration to the dermis rather quickly if it is, um, if it is that it is, if, if an infection is recognized and it is so needed. Here you have a dendritic cell and the dendritic cells could migrate into the lymphatic vesicle and then move to the area where it is recognized. So in terms of in conclusion, right, while the blood cell development is necessary, part of immune response is only a first step. You do have all of these other organs and tissues. We looked at it, we looked at the spleen, and within the small and large intestine, the bone marrow, multiple other organs and tissues must receive these blood cells and interface them with each other to achieve the proper responses. And these interfaces and the tissues involved, they are complex and they're multifaceted in that regard. And we will be looking at more of them in the next chapter, okay?